How is it going, everybody? My name is Anton Dybal, also known as a skeptical human on YouTube. And joining me today for a debate about libertarianism is fellow YouTuber Philosopossum, also known as uh, Andrew Grisok. Andrew, thanks for being here today. No problem, Anton. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So I wanted to start out this debate uh, by discussing our differing viewpoints on regulation, you know, talking about regulation in areas like construction, you know, building construction, uh, the environment, uh, you know, food safety, water, medicine, just well, regulation you make, in general. You could make a really sound argument, right? That's an interesting space, so we can argue that. <laughs> <laughs> So I was hoping you could just lay out your general philosophy in this viewpoint. Uh, just take, you know, a minute or two, tell us your general thoughts, and then I will uh, just respond, and then we'll just open it up from there. All right, sounds good. So I should preface this by saying that uh, there's a common misconception about what libertarians believe in terms of uh, regulation. Uh, people think that we want, like, a free, unregulated, wild west Every, everything goes type of market. That, that's their interpretation of the free market. The truth is right. that uh, libertarians aren't anti-regulation. The market works because it's very carefully regulated, right? Where we differ is on who does the regulating. So typically people would argue that we need a government. We need some government bureaucratic agency to regulate, to set the rules, to tell businesses what to do, to tell consumers what to do. Whereas the libertarian approach is more to emphasize the power that we as consumers have in regulating businesses. Uh, you know, companies only do things that are profitable. They only do things that their customers demand. And because of that, there's some impetus on the consumers to you know, demand what they want from corporations. When you, uh, I, I'm not sure you're familiar with this, with, with this or not, the idea of uh, voting with your wallet. So the idea that, sure, yeah, like let's say I like I like wolves, and there's a restaurant that's using wolf meat in their burgers, and I'm like, that that, that obviously I have a problem with that. I'm not going to eat there. They're not going to make money off of me. I'll go to, you know, somewhere else, and then perhaps I'll find other people who feel similarly and. The idea is we get we get big enough of a following going on, um, big enough of a movement, and it and it'll hit that restaurant's uh, you know de uh, spreadsheet. It'll hit, it'll hit their you know bottom line, and then they'll have no choice but to comply with what the consumers want. And that that's sort of uh, uh, and I'm not nece I'm not necessarily right off the bat saying that consumers are better than government. I'm just say offering that as sort of the libertarian viewpoint, sort of the alternative point of view that. We're not anti-regulation. We just think that the regulatory power should be largely consumer-focused rather than government-focused, uh, if that makes sense. So, yeah, okay. So, generally, your take is uh, if if companies, corporations are doing stuff that's irresponsible, that's undesirable, uh, consumers, through their wallet, through their purchasing power, they can choose to patronize or not patronize that business. And basically what you're saying is through that sort of consumer power, you'll have companies acting in desirable ways. Is, is that a fair way to summarize what you just said? Correct. Okay. So I see a lot of problems with that. Sure. Number one, uh, I, I guess first we could start out with an area of agreements. I also like wolves, so there's that. Um, <laughs> but some of the major problems I see with this viewpoints is, number one, it assumes that we would have knowledge that the bad things are actually taking place. You know, like you go to you go to the restaurant, you open up the menu, and it says we're serving wolves. Realistically, the reason that we have so many of these regulatory agencies and these bodies that step in and monitor and ensure compliance and things like that is because a lot of these things would be hard to test for. You know, if you have a company that's like, that's dumping waste in a river, and there isn't an agency to actually test the waste to see what's what's getting dumped into the river. The, you know, there's not going to be consumers who are like paddling out there on kayaks and testing it themselves and, and running analyses across like their chemical database to see whether this is harmful or not and conducting the scientific studies on like which chemicals cause harm and which don't. So so maybe in that one specific narrow example of like, oh, they're serving wolf meats, perhaps consumers could step in and play a role. But in things like in things like pollution uh, or, you know, building construction and stuff like that, where it might not be quite as visible that harm is being done, then I don't really see how that sort of uh, voting with your wallets or reg regulating through your purchasing power 
could could actually have a beneficial impact. Right. So that's one of the common criticisms uh, that we get from people who are pro, you know, government regulation. They say, well, in order for consumers to be able to properly vote with their wallet and make these types of decisions, they need to be fully aware of what's going on. And it's not always immediately obvious, say, when a restaurant is passing something off as chicken that's not, or say when uh, construction companies sort of half-ass building houses or uh, companies are dumping in the river. <clears throat> so that is a legitimate problem that consumers simply don't uh, – there, there's no there's no practical way for them to know everything bad that's going on, or perhaps they don't have the knowledge and skills to, say, evaluate specifically uh, the quality of construction or something like that. And uh, my response to that is that's just another problem for the the market to take care of. So every that's a, that I'm sorry, that sounds incredibly vague. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, absolutely. So what I was getting at was that anytime the anytime you have a problem, right? One of, the, one of the things that's really nice about the free market is that anytime you have a problem, any problem, that creates demand for a solution. So that creates a market, that creates a potential profit for someone who's willing to come along and provide a solution. So these these issues with, say, lack of consumer awareness, lack of specific knowledge, these are simply just other problems that can be dealt with by the market, by someone willing to uh, bring forth a solution. So right off the top of my head, uh, consumer consumer protection is, is just another commodity that the market can provide. That and there are actually examples of companies doing this. Uh, probably the absolute biggest one that comes to mind is I'm not sure you've heard of them. They're called Underwriters Laboratories. Uh, it's vaguely familiar. Right. So there's a company called Underwriters Laboratories. They're a private sector, and they do more or less what people want government regulatory bodies to do, to inspect the quality of products, pass off on it, make sure that it's, you know, not going to do be, be dangerous. And it's, it's sort of filling that role that um, regulations are intended to, to fill, sort of protecting consumers, passing off on the safety of products, but it's being provided by the free market. It's a private entity. It's being provided by the free market. It's not, it's it's not run by government. It's not relying on like coercion and taxation and things like that. So that would be the libertarian response to that. Sort of the idea that yes, it's true that not everybody's going to be fully aware or have all the knowledge or resources they need to make these decisions. But uh, that's just another problem that the mark that the market can solve, uh, basically. I would say a couple of things to that. Number sure. one, by by pointing out that oh, we could have these uh, these these free market private institutions fill the role of governments by making that point you're conceding that these regulations are beneficial and that they do have beneficial impacts so so if we're granting that like no we need these functions we need people uh you know testing the safety of our food and making sure our water isn't toxic and filled with lead and making sure our buildings aren't going to you know collapse and fall on your head and kill you during an earthquake or whatever if we're conceding that all of these functions are indeed beneficial why do away with the government regulations then well, because many people would argue that the private sector uh, is more efficient. There are several benefits you have from the private sector that you don't from government. Probably the biggest one off the top of my head is uh, choice. The simple matter that there's di there's different – in the private sector, you have different um, sort of quality control um, entities. Like when in, the, in government, there's usually like one FDA or one uh, FCC or one uh, – sort of agency that insp that inspects things and they sort of have the final say on y yay or nay, whether it passes or fails. And, the, and the, the choice that you have in the free market kind of improves on that situation where it's like uh, there's different, you, you can now have different companies taking different approaches. You have more of a choice. Let's say this company is able to do better quality inspections, maybe at a lower cost, or this one does more thorough inspections, or that sort of gives consumers a little bit more freedom. Uh, that's probably the first benefit. Uh, another benefit is that it's most most of the time it's voluntary. That is, it's not based on coercion. So a lot of these regulations, they're when the, when the FDA or or the the building codes or whomever, they're usually not asking or suggesting you build your house this way. They're saying if you don't build your house this way, there will be a there will be consequences in terms of violence. Like we will we will 
impose a fine on you. We will send uh, someone with a gun. I wouldn't exactly call a fine violence. Non-payment result. I mean, it, it, that's that's kind. Of, it's 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 one of the steps they put in between. I mean, yeah. But I get your I get what you're saying. So these. Uh, private sector inspection firms, they're more focused on a voluntary approach, more of a cooperative. Uh, so there's a lot of animosity from mostly conservatives, uh, conservative business owners who are like, they hate regulations. They hate the, the very idea of consumer protection just rubs them the wrong way because their their experience with con with consumer protection has largely been this and this, you know, anti this, uh, combative type of, of arrangement where someone comes along and bosses you around, tells you what you need to do, threatens you, my way or the highway, where these, of all, these private sector, uh, quality control firms, I guess you could call them, are more cooperative. They're saying, we're going to ins offer positive incentives. We're going to. Right, for sure. Right. And, and there's, there's more leeway. Like if, if, if a government agency comes along and says, we're, this is the regulation you have to follow, and it's overly burdensome on the company. You know they're they're stuck with it. Whereas the, the private um, inspection firm, they can be like, "All right, well we need we need to protect our consumers. We need to have this minimum level of quality." But we understand um, your your side of it too. When we, we'll adjust some maybe some of our more strenuous requirements to, to sort of ease. yeah yeah. If if I could jump in here absolutely uh, and, and respond to some of that uh, sure. You're, you're framing the fact that there's no force of law behind it as if it's a problem, whereas actually the exact reverse is the case. If there's no force of law mandating compliance with these regulations, then it all just becomes a matter of personal preference, whether I want to pay these companies to come and certify my building and ensure that I'm following code and then have to pay the extra money to make sure my building is in compliance with all these codes. Whereas if you leave it up to the employers, and the people who are actually doing the building to decide this on their own. Then they can simply cut corners, they can build this half-assed building that on the surface might look good, but you know, it, it could be constructed using shoddy techniques, and it could fall and kill people. And so that's why you need these regulatory bodies to actually have the force of law behind it, because without that, you know, people are going to cut corners, people are going to get killed, and uh, it's going to cause a lot of issues. Right, well there's two uh, point. There's two assumptions you kind of made there. The first one is that they wouldn't have the force of law, period. Second one being is that the force of law is the only thing that motivates people. Now, as far as as far as the first one goes, the force of law, and and I'm not sure. I made a video sort of responding to Dave Rubin, uh, Joe Rogan's interview with Dave Rubin. I'm not sure if you've seen it. You haven't. I okay. Did not. But basically, um, at the part where uh, Dave Rubin mentions uh, we can have private sector companies inspect the houses. And then Joe responds by asking, well, what's what's the incentive? What's the legal force behind it? And the simple, the simple right. answer to that is that you can create some legal force using a, using a, 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 a contract. And I sort of described how it would work, like a three-way contract. You have the builder, you have the customer, the builder, and the inspector. So let's say I want a house built, right? But I, I'm not, uh, I don't trust the construction company 100%. But there's this uh, inspection company that I, that I really trust. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draft a three-way contract. Basically, what it says is that the construction company doesn't get paid until the inspector pass until the inspector that we agree, agree on passes off on it. Once that inspector agrees on it, the liability, if the house collapses, transfers to that inspector. And this sort of uh, addresses a lot of the cri main criticisms a system like this would have. Like uh, w one of them being that what incentive does the builder have to have the house inspected if it's not mandated by law? Well, that's well, that's what it is. And the in the co the contract specifies you don't get paid until it passes the inspection. And of course, the other uh, common objection is, well, what if the inspection company uh, is in cahoots with the construction company or they get bribed or whatever? Right. They have an incentive not to do that because now. As a condition of uh, being of being uh, participating in this contract, the liability if the house collapses transfers to them. So it's a neat little way of sort of package of having this three-way, almost like a checks and balances kind of thing, like the the equivalent, you know, checks and balances in the government, but the equivalent concept in the private sector where each party 
has a little bit of leverage over the other and, and uh, we have a little bit of rope to kind of, if they try to step over the line or abuse their power, we have a way to kind of pull them back, if, if that makes sense. And Yeah, for sure. So so basically what you're saying is it's not it's not as coercive because people voluntarily enter in, enter into this agreement in in the form of a contract. Um yeah, it, you know, I guess my question would be if if we set up a system like that where there are these three-way contracts, uh you know, it it seems like let's say there's a breach of contract and let's say the building collapses on your head and uh, you know, like crushes you and kills your whole family. Who who is going to be there to challenge that company in court if if you're dead because the building collapsed and killed you? Uh, well, there's there's depending on the circumstances, there's several different ways you can answer this, and this is this is a sort of a repackaging of a common uh, criticism of anarcho-capitalism, the idea that okay, if 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 there's no government and you you kill somebody who um, who sues? Who sues you? They can't sue you if you're dead, right? So what's the deterrent for murder? It, it's kind of a, a more specific, nuanced repackaging of that basic idea. But there's several different ways you could answer that. Uh, immediately, uh, if anyone in the fam, if anyone surviving would would, would sue them, but um, from what it from from what the, the scenario as you've presented, it seems like there's nobody. Everyone in the house died. Is if is that correct? So, yeah, let's say everyone, I mean, even if everyone else didn't die, it, it seems like that that's kind of, it's kind of like a, a small consolation to say, well, at least one of your family members didn't die and they can go and challenge this company in court. And, and maybe if they're lucky enough to go up against this extremely wealthy company that, that can afford teams of lawyers and somehow against all odds challenge them in court for breach of contract, then maybe there's a slim chance that, that they could win. It seems like that's just not as good of a system as having the entire force of the government uh, behind you to enforce those regulations. Hmm. What would you say to that? Well, I'm trying to think. Well, uh, it kind of goes along with another point I mentioned in that video, the idea that this kind of assumes that the government inspectors are sort of, you know, 100% on, uh, that, that the, the inspection being done by the government is actually good. Cause that's kind of the assumption you're making that the, 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 the government will come in and inspect the house to make sure that everything is, you know, up to par that they'll properly carry Well, yeah, that's, that's their job as, as employees of that regulatory agency. That's what they're hired to do. So it seems like a pretty fair assumption. Right, but you can, but what sort of what what's the penalty if they don't uh, inspect it thoroughly? Because in my in my scenario with the three way contract, there's there's stakes involved. Like if if the if the builder does a crappy job, they they don't the, the house doesn't pass. If the inspector does a crappy job they're liable for the house collapsing. So what sort of the, what, what, I, I mean, uh, they're, they're guaranteed their income because of taxation. We'll, we'll get into details on that later, but sure. Sort of I, You're I, saying what's the penalty for the government employee not doing a good job inspecting. That's your question. Yes. Number one, they get fired and lose their job. And number two, uh, since it's probably a violation of laws that they're there to enforce, they would most likely, uh, face legal penalties, perhaps going to jail for not uh, complying with these regulations and, and face the real threat of law. So it seems like that is a much better incentive to actually make sure that you're reg uh, you're regulating these buildings correctly than having a private company where, uh, you know, their legal resources are much bigger than those of the people who might end up challenging them in court. Right. Well, there's sort of two assumptions that you're kind of making there. First assumption being that the legal framework would be exactly the same in a more libertarian system as it is now. Because, yeah, it, right. in our current... Right, right. So in our current legal system, the way it works is that uh, courts are largely monopolized by the government. Arbitration is monopolized by the government. 
to a large extent. Uh, a lot of anarchists will make a big deal out of, oh, the government monopolizes arbitration. No, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but the, they, they do have a pretty good stronghold on it. And, uh, oh yeah, another thing is that the, uh, because of regulations, like the, the Bar Association has a monopoly on legal services, that they artificially infl inflate the price of lawyers. Uh, and and a lot of other uh, types of laws make the court system overly strenuous and sort of uh, biased against the little guy. And that's that's one thing that would definitely change in a libertarian type system. And the other the other assumption you're making is that you, you'd almost kind of have the same problem. Um, let, let's let's suppose that we had the government system, right, where the government inspects the house and the house collapses on everybody and kills them. Who goes after the government for not carrying out their responsibility? So it would seem like if the house collapses and everyone inside of it dies, the issue of who goes after the negligent people, it would exist whatever system you're using. Well, my, my response to that, uh, I, I get the point that you're making, and it's definitely not an unfair point to make, but my response would be who goes after the government in that case? other people at the government whose job it is to enforce compliance with these regulations. Whereas the flip side in, in your situation where it's, it's the company, it's the inspector, and it's the family that gets killed by the building. In that situation, there really is nobody to go after these two bodies because it's not like the companies are going to sue themselves and, and, and you know, try to, try, try to you know, like enforce uh, a breach of contract against themselves because ultimately what they're going after is money. So in the case of the government, there really is an inbuilt mechanism to go after people within these organizations because th that's what the law says. Whereas for companies, it's all about uh, money at the end of the day for them. Right. So since it's all about money, for, well, there's uh, there's three responses I have uh, in that situation. The first one is that, and again, this goes back to that sort of who, who goes after murderers in, in anarcho-capitalism. Basically, uh, it would come down to uh, life insurance. If if there if if let's say so, uh, I'm just being more general. So if the family had like life insurance, or or perhaps there would be a clause in the contract saying, in the event that the house collapses and everyone dies and there's no one left to litigate it, this is the process that happens after that there would most likely be some type of con of, of clause in that contract who handles that liability it may be uh at whatever insurance company that family has uh another so that so that that would be my uh answer to that to that particular question and the other one is that uh the builders uh, as as a uh, as another clause you could potentially add to this contract is like let's say that the uh the house, the house collapses, right? Because the inspector didn't do his job right. There could be some kind of clause in the in the in the contract that basically allows the construction company to go after the inspector. Like, hey, you signed off on this house when you shouldn't have. You made our construction company. We we were a lot. We relied on you to sort of maintain our company image, and you let us down. So that that's that's another potential avenue you could take in that situation. And. Uh, Another one is that uh, I feel that saying that the government goes after the government or the government would internally hold themselves responsible, I feel like there's potentially some uh, conflict of interest issues there. Because if you think about it, imagine like when, when private sector companies uh, do this, like when a private sector company was like, okay, there was some kind of fraud going on. We did an internal investigation. Our company did an internal right. and found we did nothing wrong. And that would be a very clear red flag. Oh, that's conflict of interest, right? So that's the, that's something kind of, if you're going to argue the government holds the government responsible, there's that conflict. If, if you're going to argue entity X holds entity X responsible for its malfeasance, there's always going to be a, a inherent conflict of interest that you'll, eventually have to deal with so that that would be my yeah yeah i think for sure i think that's a fair point and i'll try to respond uh in turn to to what you just said there so in terms of the life insurance policy thing you basically said like well you know we could write it into our life insurance policies where there's a clause where it's like in the event of a building collapse uh the insurance company goes after the building company it seems to me that if we're living in a society where it's such a commonplace occurrence that buildings are collapsing and crushing us that we need to make it a habit to take it upon ourselves to write this into our life insurance policy just just as a matter of like 
you know, you know, going about our daily lives, it seems to me that that indicates a pretty serious problem with uh, the, the sort with the vision of society that you're outlining. I would also point out that in this example we're talking about, we're just oversimplifying it for the sake of the conversation. We just have this one uh, idealized example here. But in reality, there, you know, you would have to you would have to negotiate and write these clauses into your life insurance policy for twenty thousand different things, for the car that you purchase, for uh, you know the uh, the food that you're purchasing, the water that you're drinking, and you can you can just you know repeat this uh, really just infinitely because like ev everything you do in life carries some risk where without uh without the government there to step in and regulate if we had to take it upon ourselves to to you know come up with these these strategies to like guard against that in the event of getting killed or seriously hurt by that it seems like that would just be needlessly complicated and like who could possibly keep track of all this stuff right ex exactly but when you say when you when you remember when you say stuff like that like who will keep track of all this what you're what you're doing is you're just saying hey here's another here's another problem for an entrepreneur entrepreneur to come along and do something about so you could have like uh expert uh contract drafters we already have them they're a contract attorneys people pay top dollar for these contract attorneys because they know what they're doing and they know uh they, they know how to cover you know every situation that can possible that bad situation that can happen and uh, like I said, if without, without a bar association monopolizing attorneys, they'd be super cheap. What What would your response be to my point that if we live in a society where this is such a real concern that without regulation, buildings might collapse on your head, that we have to make it a habit to write this into our life insurance policy? What does that say about the sort of uh, society you're outlining for us? Well, hmm, that's a good point, actually. Uh well, I guess the biggest thing I would say is that it's meant to be, it's meant to be more of a, a precaution rather than something that you intend to use. Just like any, anything, I'd, I'd imagine I would go for anything in a life insurance policy. Like you, you're you're sitting down writing this, probably thinking, I'll probably never use this. Like yeah, it's something you make as, as more of a precautionary measure. And I'd argue regulations are almost kind of the same thing. They're there to be a precautionary measure uh, to prevent something bad from hap from happening. You know, like, yeah, I, yeah, I totally get the point that you're making. Right. Let me ask you this then. Sure. Let's say, let's say in this example, let's say you have a family that, for whatever reason, they didn't have the time or they didn't take the initiative to write the sort of clause into their life insurance policy. They have a three-way contract. The construction company they cut corners to save money. The building collapses, kills their entire family. Since there's no insurance policy in place, since they didn't take those potential contingencies that you outlined, in that situation, how is the company held accountable? Well, there could be, well, there's three parties to the contract, right? One of them is gone, but there's still two others. And like I said, the the whole idea behind a three-way contract is that everybody has, it, it, it works sim similar to the way the, the uh What's it called? The three, the separation of powers work in in government. Same concept, just applied to the private sector, right? Each person has some leverage over the other to kind of a little rope to pull them back if they step out of bounds. So in this right. case, right? Uh, let's suppose that uh, worst case scenario happens: family dies, um, no one survives to go after them. They have no relatives to go out to, to go after them. No no neighbors that they're real close to who would be willing to do it for them. There'd be no, there was no life insurance, uh, absolute doomsday, worst case scenario. Let's go there. So there's still two other parties in the contract and the builder and the inspector, right? So the builder is now on record having built a house that killed a family, right? Now, even though the, the actual liability is on the inspector, the, the builder it can still be like, well, hold on a second. You guys kind of screwed us over because we we were relying on you to make sure the house was built properly, you know, and it collapsed. So we we lost a uh, reputation because of that. You know, people there's we we're on record having a, built a home that killed a family, and and we were we were you you were sort of supposed to kind of help us protect our reputation there, and you you let us down. So the construction company could then go after the inspectors. Let me ask you this then, sure. if they did that though, that would absolutely guarantee 
if the construction company went after the inspectors, that guarantees the inspector is never going to do business with that construction company again. So this isn't even corruption here I'm talking about. This this was just like rational business decisions where it's like, well, these people tried to sue us. We don't want to do business with them. So it seems like that provides a pretty clear disincentive to actually engage in this sort of uh, after the collapse uh, litigation that you're talking about here. Because if they're not going to do business with them, um, you know, it, it, it sort of gets gets to that point you made earlier where it's like, you you regulate through your wallets and it's you know by by going after them it seems like it would uh it would almost guarantee no future business you see what i'm saying i, I feel like i worded that poorly but but i think i got the yeah point. i understand what, i understand the point you're trying to get across and i think the idea is that when, when when you're when they would make that business decision they would sort of evaluate ahead of time there's because you could make that case for a lot of potential business decisions. There's always potential for lit litigation. I mean, the the world's not life isn't perfect. I mean, there's uh, things go wrong all, all unexpectedly all the time. So you could really make an argument that any engagement could ha involve potential uh, litigation. So uh, chances are they would ahead of time before entering these types of decisions sort of you know formulate whether or not the the risk of uh, litigation would be worth what what they would get out out of it, and if if they're doing everything properly, if they're serving their customers, if they're doing their job, then yeah, that the, the chance of the litigation actually being an issue is is very small. So it it would seem like yeah, that's a possible problem. But thinking about it rationally, you know, it's like it, it's like if if they're doing their job and everything, there's a very little chance of that happening. Yeah, I guess my general response to, to this conversation and exchange we've had would be I don't want to live in a world where we have such a system where a construction company cuts corners, uh, a house collapse, and that one surviving family member whose entire family was just killed has to take it upon themselves to take this company to court. I would much rather live in a system where we simply have these regulations built into law. We have government inspectors who ensure compliance, penalize people who violate this. Everything's taken care of like that. That to me is a much better system than, than the sort of cockamamie system of like uh, complicated contracts and, and trying to sue companies for cutting corners, which inevitably they would do. I mean, would you not, would you not agree with, with the point that they would try to cut corners in the system more so than they do under our current regulatory system. Um, I would not just because it's more it's more descent when you when you have something that's more decentralized. There, there's two differences between the government regulatory system and sort of what I propose is like the private regulatory system. With the private regulatory system, it's more decentralized and it's more I guess directly focused on the customer. So if you think about how the, the government works, it's like you have this one zoning board that's supposed to inspect all the houses being built in, in, in this area. And it's, it's more or less that you don't, you don't have a choice. It's not like it can be like, Oh, well this, well, this, ins this zoning, this, uh, code inspector, com uh, agency or whatever, they're, they're, they're backlogged, right? I'll, I'll go to the other one down the street. It's like, it doesn't it doesn't work that way it's very centralized so you lose some efficiency in terms of how well you can enforce it how how well you can monitor all the, all the construction going on and of course there's the other issue of you know being customer oriented there's uh when you when you have the the uh government code inspectors right they're uh they're they're guaranteed funding through taxation they're their their job is to go. They're not interacting directly with their customers. They're not you know they don't have a, a direct stake in the house collapsing. Uh, they don't. Uh, they they're not getting direct feedback from from like the, the the construction company. Like hey this 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 here may be a little too strenuous. Or hey we know your code says to do this, but we have a potentially better way of doing it that won't compromise the quality. Like there's more flexibility. There's more uh, direct interaction with the customer. There's more stakes. Like I, I'm not. I, I understand uh, what you're saying that um, you, you would prefer a more systematic, uh, universal approach. And you, you not just systematic, but more effective in my view, because there's an actual force of law behind it, and not this obligation that people need to, you, you know, build all these contingencies into their life insurance policies. 
through, you know, because of something simple like getting a house built or purchasing a car, you know, not just not just systematic, but in my view, much more effective. Right, right. And I, I feel that I feel I feel that the decentralized sort of more customer oriented approach is, is more if effective. Would you agree with uh, Dave Rubin's general point he made? I I know he he's definitely not the most eloquent uh, expositor of uh, libertarian ideas, yeah. but would you agree with his his general argument he made? in that Joe Rogan podcast where he was like, well, you know, the, the building company, ultimately they have an incentive to provide the best building that they can. And therefore we don't need these regulations to tell them what to, what to do because through the market, through consumer feedback and reviews and so forth, there's going to be an incentive to, to build the best building that you can. Would you agree with that? Well, I've, I've, I'm not strictly taking, I'm not strictly taking one side or the other. I'm more, I think there's some truth to what he what he said. Like, of course, nobody, no construction company wants to be known for like building uh, crappy houses that collapse, or you know, they don't want nobody wants no construction company wants to pay out a bunch of lawsuits for houses that collapse. So there's the, and, and you know, people generally, I, I pers this is my opinion. You'll probably disagree with me, but I think people generally take pride in their work, especially a field like construction. Um, you go to you, that's something that you go to school for. That you 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 learn you learn usually it's a family business a, a family name goes with it uh, you know so uh, I, I feel people generally take uh, I pride in what they do so I, I feel that there's a lot of truth to what uh, the general idea is that even he he's not the best at articulating them but I feel there's some general truth to the idea that yes there's an inherent incentive in these these companies to these building companies to produce high quality homes that being said I do. Yeah, I I do kind of understand that uh, be, these construction workers, these construction companies, are human. They're they're at the end of the day, they have they have to put bread on the table. They're gonna try and cut corners whenever they can. The, the average person isn't that uh, construction savvy. They might take advantage of that. So I, I understand sort of the points on both sides, and that's sort of the the advantage I feel that the free market has because it's free because it's flexible you can sort of find a, a good middle ground between two different uh, opposing ideas. Yeah, I would say, and I mean this respectfully, not not trying to insult you or anything. I think that viewpoint that, you know, the building company has every incentive to provide the best building that they can for society. That general viewpoint strikes me as incredibly naive. I think at the end of the day, especially large companies, you know, it's one thing to talk about like some small mom and pop family business where it's like they take pride in the work that they do. You know, that might be a different conversation. But when we're talking about a large profit seeking company, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in revenue. At the end of the day, what they're after is profits, plain and simple. They're going to cut corners when they can. They're going to necessarily, they're not necessarily going to make the building as structurally sound as they could. You know, if you could cut costs by 20% and make it so like, maybe in, instead of protection against like a seven magnitude earthquake, this building will only protect up to like a four magnitude earthquake, you know, just like fill in the blank with a bunch of different things like, uh, like tornadoes or wind speeds or something like that, you know, they could build buildings that on the outside look structurally sound, but in terms of the actual safety, they're not going to be up to par uh, at the level that they would be under the sort of regulatory system. So it was, I just think that whole mindset of like, in the absence of regulations, companies will continue to build buildings up to the standards that they're required to under the force of law. I think it's naive. And I think the fact that you're positing this whole private regulatory system to step in and play the role of these government regulators, I feel like you're implicitly conceding that point as well. Right. Well, I, I am conceding the point that uh, companies aren't aren't 100 percent perfect and that, uh, you know, that the however honest or hardworking or however much pride you take in your work, the the money incentive, you know, the, the basic greed isn't, basic human greed isn't going away, however much pride you take in your work. I'm, I'm very realistic in, in that sense and sort of accepting the reality of it. But when, what I advocate for, what the reason I advocate for privatizing regulations is because uh, generally I believe the private sector um, does things better than government generally. And I also believe that uh, 
in, in, a, in a free market system where, where it's flexible and there's more freedom to decide like what solutions work for you, that that will generally lead to a better outcome. Like I'm not even saying like, cause I, uh, some, some libertarians are even more extreme than me. Like, uh, was it Dave Rubin was putting a lot of emphasis on the, uh, he, he does mention private inspectors, but he seemed like he was putting more emphasis on the, the quality of the, the construction, the, the reputation and everything. I, I, I'm, I'm more realistic. I'm like, okay, you know what? Yeah. People cut corners. People do stuff that can affect people's safety. It's not a perfect world. But let's let's address this problem the same way we do with every other problem using like free market innovation. Because that's that's right. Uh, yeah, for sure. I I understand the point you're making, and you know, like I said, Dave Rubin definitely is no uh, Nobel Prize winner by any means. I feel like he did a very poor job of representing uh, r representing his arguments on that show. It, it, and you know, it seemed like yeah. he was kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth as well, because he would right, like, well, he would present an idea, and then when challenged on it, he would walk it back like, "Well, no, I just think it's intellectually interesting and stimulating to, right. to think about these ideas." And so you, I, seen... you know, I wouldn't you I wouldn't yeah. use Dave Rubin as the benchmark for for like for for the best ideas yeah. on your side. I like guess. even libertarians make fun of them. Have you seen uh, Freedom Tunes? No. So, yeah, I yeah. Freedom <laughs> Tunes did a video making fun of them. Uh, the Dave Rubin report. He's like, the regressive left is very regressive. Oh, yeah, that's the cartoon, yeah, right? PC culture. Yeah, I saw that one. I agree. I agree. With <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah. That's that's, that's probably the, right. well, one thing everyone on the political spectrum can come together on. You know, making fun of Dave Rubin. It's sad. No one respects that guy. Even his own subreddit has turned against him and just makes fun of him ruthlessly. Like he has a bunch of subscribers, but it's it seems like he's such a punching bag and just just like so not respected in in the the political YouTube community. It's it's I almost feel bad for him, but I don't. Right. Yeah. It's it's one of those things where it's like you know, preparation is is key. Like I did a lot of preparation for this. Uh, so it's good. Yeah. Right. So I'd like to. I'd like to segue a little bit and give a couple of historical examples that I think are relevant to this conversation. Go right ahead. Um, so there are a couple of events in early American history that I think illustrate the importance of regulation that's enforced through law. One is the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire. Now, this was a fire that killed 145 people. Uh, basically, the background story is this was a company where you know, they had they would lock women on the factory floor, put them in these dangerous, hot, unsafe conditions with a bunch of flammable materials around. And they would literally lock them into the factory floor to where, like, they were forced to stay there and work for long stretches and they couldn't leave and so forth. A fire broke out and uh, a bunch of people died horribly. You know, it wasn't like a quick, painless death. People people burned to death. People jumped out of the Yay. building while they were on fire. People died horribly. And, and, and you know, there were, there were no requirements that... Uh, that there be sprinkler systems, that employers give their uh, employees certain freedoms and certain rights. And ultimately, that's what ended up happening. Another example worth mentioning is uh, the Chicago, Illinois, Iroquois theater fire. This was, this happened in 1903, I believe, where uh, 600 people ended up dying because the theater opened up, a fire broke out, uh, and the building because there weren't regulations in place that said you need to have fire extinguishers placed at these locations, you need to have fire suppression sprinklers, you need to have clearly marked exits. Uh, you know, people tried to exit the building and, and the doors were locked and it was really hard to open the doors. A bunch of people ended up getting trampled and crushed and burned to death. Again, this is another thing where the regulations weren't there and a bunch of people ended up dying. And the last example I'll give, and then I'll open it up to you to respond, is... Uh, the General Slocum Ferry Fire. This, this this happened in 1904, and this was a ferry that was transporting people across a body of water. Again, the same thing happened. A fire broke out. There were no regulations mandating that the crew be trained on how to respond to a fire. The, there were no regulations mandating that the fire hose on board the ship be inspected regularly, be up to certain standards. So when they tried to bust it out and use it, the thing was like 13 years old. It just fell apart, completely useless. And on top of that, the life preservers that they gave to people when they had to abandon ship and, and you know, try to try to try to survive in the water. The life preservers, very poorly made, not up to any sort of standards or certifications. And they basically functioned as like lead vests that just like sunk people down to the bottom. A thousand people ended up dying. And the one commonality here in all these examples is in the absence of of common sense building regulations people were subjected to dangerous building conditions that got people killed. And after these events happened, the response to it was to pass regulations as a corrective to all of this. And uh, I would just wonder how you respond to that. 
Right. So I'm going to be uh, absolutely honest with you. Um, I'm going to be I'm going to be actually intellectually honest and admit I don't know a whole lot about each of those events. Um, I don't have much historical background on it. Um, I will say that I know a little bit of background about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, and that's uh, because I'm actually a huge advocate of unions. Uh, I think unions do an excellent job at protecting workers' rights when they're not being, you know, shackled by government regulations when they're when they're able to just operate. They do an excellent job at protecting workers' rights. And this, the sad part about the whole uh, shirtwaist triangle factory is that you often had uh, unions would there there were at the time when that happened there were laws in place restricting the ability of unions to collectively bargain. In fact, actually. Um, Immediately, I remember there was a story immediately after the, the fire happened, there were u union protesters on the street outside the factory saying, hey, this shouldn't have happened. Your, your work conditions should have been safer. And they were out there demanding this. The, the police, came, the government police came in and told them to piss off. So in, in, in this instance, it, it's like the, the unions were sort of inhibited from exercising their ability to uh, – collectively bargain and protest and, and influence the employer to treat, treat the workers more fairly. So that's my reaction to that. And then for, for the other instances, uh, like, again, I'm not hundred percent familiar with the historical context, but like I said, my solution would still be largely privatized regulation, privatized inspections. Now with the last example, you mentioned two things, fire hoses and life jackets. I believe both of those are in fact inspected by underwriters laboratories, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, uh, which is, which again is a private sector company that inspects the quality of things. So there, there's, yeah, probably subject to government regulations that they, that they have to operate within though. True. I, I will admit, I don't know the entirety of all the regulations because there's, there's so many regulations. There's like pages and pages of them and they pass new ones every day. So it's hard to, well, stay on top yeah, of. I mean, the way the way it works with a lot of these agencies is sometimes they do outsource some of these functions to private companies, but these companies have to operate within these legal strictures that are outlined in uh, the regulatory laws that are passed. It's it's not like you just hand it off to a company and you're like, go do whatever the fuck you want, you know? Right. I see what you're saying. Uh, I I wouldn't be able to give you I don't, I don't know the entire background and how heavily regulated these these companies are. Um, I, I couldn't give you a, a straightforward answer, but I could I could say that I, th I think there there is a market uh, solution that's like like I said the, the key thing is that the the free market would probably provide a solution to all all of these things. Yeah, let 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 me just. Uh... Let me take a few steps back and just sure. sort of reiterate some of the conditions that led to these tragedies, since you're familiar with the, the Triangle Shirtwaist. To, to a certain extent. I know what happened with the unions. Sure, sure, sure. But, you know, a lot of libertarians, their their general viewpoint is, you know, the government should, uh, should get rid of all these burdens and regulations and let the employers do what they want. It seems like that sort of vision of society that you're calling for would lead to exactly the sort of things we're talking about, where employers can treat their employees however they want and say, you know, you're going to work 12 hour shifts. We're going to lock the factory door. And if you don't like it, uh, you know, you can you can sever your contract with us and go and engage in some other volu voluntary contract with another employer. Under your system, there'd be no necessary obligations that. Uh, this build, you know, especially if the building is designed not for individuals, but if it's just like a company building that they lease out there, there's not, there's not going to be the same sort of uh, uh, like incentive structure to, to, to make the building super safe and build all these sprinklers and so forth. So the basic point that I want to try to get across is uh, I feel like these sort of libertarian is these sort of libertarian calls to deregulate these spaces. This is not progress. This is the elimination of progress because it's eliminating these regulations that were passed after people got killed, after people died horribly. And we looked at an event like this and we saw, my goodness, if only there was some sort of regulation saying you can't lock your employees in, uh, in a dangerous factory. If only there was a regulation saying you had to have up to date sprinkler systems. It's looking at the disasters after the fact, seeing what could we have done to prevent it. 
that's what leads to these sort of regulations that libertarians then show up and say we should get rid of these. So I feel like it's the elimination of progress and in, in, in passing these sort of uh, implementing these changes you're talking about would really set us back and get us back to this earlier time period where things like this happened. Right. Well, uh, a few uh, points to respond to that. First point is that I feel that that's not taking every single factor into account. Like it's it's assuming that employee safety increased only because of regulation. Like if if we roll back all the regulations to say the 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 steam engine era, then there would be just the same amount of danger. Even though a lot of this a lot of the safety, you know, that happened because of te the, the increase in safety happened because of technology. Like machines right. using electricity of less moving parts, less uh, than machine than steam machines, less. Uh, a chance to get your arm caught in it or something. So that's that's sort of the first assumption that makes. Well, it's not the only factor. Right. I would definitely agree with the point you're making, but it definitely is a factor that, you know, OSHA stepping in and coming into the workplace and saying you can't lock your, your employees on the factory floor, which is filled with flammable materials. I mean, would you at least concede that that's part of it? I, I will I'll concede that it, 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 contrib it contributes. I, I won't say that it doesn't because I'm not, I don't know everything. I'm, that's, that's the thing. If you, when you're having discussions like this, you have to be intellectually honest and admit when you don't know everything and that there's simply no way to know. Like I, I have no way to, to like calculate crunch numbers and be like this percentage of decrease in deaths was caused by this, this percentage was caused, you know what I mean? Well, no, we, we sure we can't be exact about it, but, but just as a matter of common sense, I mean, if if we had a system, we had two systems on offer. In one system, you can lock your employees on the factory floor with all sorts of flammable materials around. In the other system, you can't do that. In which system will more people die in horrible building fires? It seems pretty obvious, you know. Right. Like even if we even if we can't get the exact statistic, like well, this will cause a, a forty eight percent reduction in you know even if we can't be exact about it, just as a matter of common sense, it's it's painfully obvious that this system is going to be the better one. Is it though? Because remember, there's there's an assumption kind of being made uh, when you when you say uh, I'd rather have a a, a systematic uh, society wide solution like implemented by the force of government or whatever. Uh, there and and uh, th this sort of a, uh, goes back to what we were saying before. Like, would you rather have the private system or the public system? Have you ever heard of? Um, do you have, have you ever watched Shane Killian at all? No, I don't think so. Okay, uh, he's another libertarian YouTuber. I, I think I sent him. I think I sent a link to some of his videos in the, in an email. Uh, his "How to Argue for Statism" series. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't watch it. I'm sorry. It's fine. Uh, basically, there's a video that he he sort of came up with this idea called the cult of the un omnipotent state, and it's a logical fallacy that a lot of pro-government people make. So there's this idea that people have that. Whatever the gov whenever the government passes a law, it just happens. Like if there's a law saying mandatory sprinklers, every building just gets sprinklers. If there's a law saying weed is illegal, we all weed just disappears. Like nobody takes some, nobody thinks about like how this will be implemented, how it will be carried out, how effective it'll be. And he calls that the the cult of the omnipotent state. The idea that oh well, government. If we have government do it, then the problem just vanishes society-wide, you know, uh, without taking into account, say, like the resources you enforce it and everything. So that's that's a that's a yep. Like you say, you say uh, libertarians do a lot of wishful thinking, uh, and quite frankly, I think the the authoritarians, the big government people, they do a lot of wishful thinking. Like these people in an office somewhere who are guaranteed an income, who. Uh, do, who, who do very who interact very little with the, with the, with the people uh, who are shielded from all kinds of responsibility that they'll they'll just come in and regulate and magically save the day you know it's just I, I feel that it's not even that I necessarily feel that it's it, the private sector way of doing it is morally better necessarily like if there was a way where the government could just magically say make your shit safe. Like and, and it just happened. Then yeah, I'd, I'd be like, yeah, I'd be all for that. But there's there's sort of realities you have to consider if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I see the point you're making. As a, a, a very small point, 
I would, you know, you you've repeated several times now this notion that these government inspectors, they're guaranteed an income. As I as I made clear earlier on, they're not guaranteed an income if they don't do their job, if they do a poor job inspecting. Number one, they could get fired or number two, there's the force of law saying like, no, these are serious regulations. This is serious shit. And if you don't actually enforce compliance, uh, there's going to be the force of law behind it. That's a small point. I don't want to sidetrack the conversation with that. Just it's just an aside that I that I felt was worth reiterating. Now, in terms of this idea of the cult of the omnipotent state, yes. as uh, as it's put, this whole idea that like, well, you know, simply mandating sprinkler systems doesn't mean that 100 percent of buildings will automatically have them. We can grant that. And, and so what? Instead of instead of a thousand lives being saved, we're going to save only 500 lives if only 50 percent of buildings have the sprinkler system. It's still a net benefit for, for society. So so what's with this this standard of like if it's not absolutely 100 percent perfect, it's not even worth pursuing at all. I mean, that's the real fallacy right there. Right. I see what you're saying. And I guess sort of sort of the point to get across is that no system is perfect. Like the government's not perfect, private sector's not perfect. I think that's we can both agree on that, right? Like nobody government's sure. not for yep. business. Business is no more perfect than government. And I the the issue is sort of one of incentive structure. Uh sort of who's who's dealing with the customer, who knows the who's knows the customer's needs, who has a stake in serving the customer. Uh now when now when I say that the uh the government employees are guaranteed an income. You, your rebuttal is, well, they they get fired if they don't do their job right. Well, in my opinion, that that doesn't really address the problem. It just kind of pushes it back further because their boss is also works for the government, uh, who's making sure he's doing his job. Well, the director of that agency, well, who who, who makes sure that he's doing his job? You know, it, it's like uh, it, that's that's sort of a fundamental problem when your income is guaranteed. When there's no way for your customers to say you're doing a shitty job, I'm not paying you. The the incentives the the incentive issues are are still there. They don't really go away. That's sort of the issue. Yeah, I see the point you're making, and, and you know that is something you mentioned earlier that I didn't have a chance to respond to, where you said, well, there's sort of a conflict of interest issue. Like if there's a police shooting, for example, <laughs> and you have like the police that inspect right. it, and they're like, oh yeah, the, the you know the black guy that was running in the opposite direction who got shot in the back 14 times, totally yeah, we we, inspect, we investigated we inspect- it thoroughly. We we concluded uh, the officer felt his life was in danger. Yeah, we investigated you know, we ourselves. Like nothing bad. We investigated ourselves. Yeah. We found out nothing bad happened. Oh, gee, shocker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I, I'm not saying it's a totally invalid point. Right. The point I'm making, though, when we're talking about a regulatory body where there are like multiple layers of checks, and then you have like outside groups that also check these organizations. You know, it's it's not like these organizations are just like totally insular and like closed off and everything is like top secret and there are no other organizations that can step in and investigate them. You know, there are multiple layers of checks between these different regulatory bodies and between the legal system. So I, I just don't think it's as simple as you make it out to be where it's like, well, at the end of the day, it's like this closed off organization where there's camaraderie and there's a conflict of interest to like protect their own and so forth. I just don't think it's it's quite as simple as you make it out to be. All right. So uh, before we close out this part of our conversation and switch gears and talk about uh, the economic side of the debate, are there any other final points you'd like to make regarding regulation or some of the stuff we've talked about here? Yes. Uh, I think that there's a lot of wishful thinking involved with regulation. I mean, it's the, the idea that government, it will you know, be our guardian angel and protect all of us and it can be everywhere and solve everything. It's, it's, it's a good comforting thought, right? But the, the reality is that you know, they're not, I, I think a more comprehensive solution will, want, will be one that comes from us consumers. We know our needs better than bureaucrats. Uh, we are, we can hold people accountable in the wallet. Uh, you know, we, we can directly influence uh, businesses by, by how we consume things. And I generally think that uh, the, while the free market isn't perfect by any means, I think that generally uh, a system where that's where that's flexible, where people can kind of make decisions based on their circumstances, will be uh, will lead to ideal outcomes, generally speaking. And that's sort of, sort of my wrap up on the points I've made. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I, I guess I would close out by sort of reiterating some of the points I made. Uh, number one, I would say this this idea of government as a guardian angel that would be perfect. Total straw man. I don't think anyone believes that the government is uh, 100% perfect. As I already pointed out in my response to uh, that cult of the omnipotent state, as it's put, uh, even if the government is only 
you know, like 50% effective at enforcing compliance with regulations or whatever. That's still going to be thousands of, li of lives that are saved at the end of the day. And I, I would just like to repeat my earlier point that handing this off to private organizations and expecting the free market to enforce these same sort of regulatory strictures in terms of, you know, building designs and so forth and, and having people write it into their life insurance policies that if your, your house collapses, you can, you can go after these companies. It strikes me as realistic, uh, unrealistic rather, uh, Freudian slip there. And I would just, uh, I would just overall say that, uh, this sort of deregulatory scheme that libertarians advocate, it strikes me not as progress, but the elimination of progress. Uh, I think frankly, some of these ideas are dangerous when you look at some of the potential health consequences with, you know, like building fires, historical examples and stuff like that. And I just don't think it's a very, uh, intelligent, uh, policy direction to move in. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and switch gears here and, uh, segue into the economic part of our debates. Uh, okay. I'm joined here by libertarian fellow YouTuber who goes by Philosophossum, uh, Andrew Grisok. In part two of our uh, debate, let's let's talk about the economic side of our disagreements uh, right. in terms of, you know, subjects like the income tax, minimum wage, social safety nets, uh, the role of government or lack thereof in that space. What's what's your general assessment, if you could just briefly summarize in like a minute or two, on the economic side of uh, libertarianism? Right. So uh, the best way I can sum it up is that uh, we believe in proper, our economic views come from property rights, which are derived from self-ownership uh, without getting overly technical, because there, there is kind of a long drawn out chain of logic. But basically, you own yourself, you own your time and labor. So you you own the results of your time and labor. And that's kind of where your property rights come from. And uh, to infringe on your property rights would essentially be a second a type of secondhand slavery because you're you're sort of claiming a right to work that was performed by somebody else. So it's sort of like after the fact slavery, if that makes sense. And that 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 would that would <laughs> go on. I'm sorry. Right now, now I understand it's a little um, philosophical, little uh, uh, a, a, a little out there, I guess, but it, if you if you kind of think about it, like it's that's where uh, we, we property rights are co come from. Like if you steal twenty dollars from me, or if you force me to perform twenty dollars worth of labor, you you took advantage of twenty dollars worth of my labor. So it's like it, we essentially argue that like property, if you if you believe slavery is wrong, you kind of have to believe property in property rights. It's, it's sort of it, it, it's that's that's sort of the simplified version of it. There's there's a more nuanced, long drawn out logic chain, but that's basically the gist of it. Sure. One of my biggest problems with libertarian arguments on the side is how they use so many oversimplified comparisons and analogies between like petty theft where some robber pops out of a dark alleyway and says, give me your money. And they compare that against taxation that's used to, you know, build infrastructure and, uh, and treat the water at the water treatment plants and make sure that meat factories aren't, uh, you know, uh, filling their food with all sorts of contaminants and, and poisons and stuff like that. I think these sort of comparisons are extremely oversimplified and frankly ridiculous when you when you just look at what happens in an actual robbery <laughs> versus what happens with taxation. Yeah, I personally I have never experienced uh, a mugging where somebody says, "Hands up, give me a fraction of your money so that I can use it to improve your life and society around you." Doesn't happen very often. Uh, so I just I think these kind of comparisons, frankly, I think you'd be better off making your case in another way because comparisons like this just lose a lot of people. Right, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I do, as a libertarian, I do agree that some people go a bit over overboard with their disgruntlement and their analogies. Uh, but I think I think the idea is to get across sort of the morality of it. So I, I want to preface this by saying something that I kind of uh, and you've you've seen my response video, of course, to your your video in which you argue for the income tax. I didn't watch the entire thing, but I saw parts of it. Okay, so uh, basically one, one of the things I mentioned is that uh, there's a common mistake made when addressing the issue of like taxation, and it's it's made on both sides, both libertarians and authoritarians both make this error, and that is they lump together two different issues. So there's whether or not taxation is theft, and whether or not taxation is justified. So, uh, and I mentioned and, and in this in my video, if there's a dude who was like starving to death uh, his the his flesh was metabolizing itself. He was he was going to die if he doesn't eat immediately. 
but he doesn't have any money on him. He goes into the grocery store, grabs a few things off the shelf, and eats it. Like, he stole. He, he ate stuff without paying for it, but nobody would... I, I don't think many people would really fault him for that or put, in, put a whole lot of blame on him. So there's the issue... So I, I feel like there's the issue of whether or not taxation is theft and whether or not it's justified. And and there's and I mentioned this in the beginning of my response video, the, 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 some of the confusion. When, when people say... When libertarians say taxation is theft, people often get this knee-jerk reaction like, oh, it, it can't be theft. It's, it's not theft. And, and they bring up all these irrelevant points. They're, they're kind of misunderstanding exactly what it is libertarians mean when they say that. They're, we're saying that, not necessarily that, they say stuff like, uh, oh, you benefit from it, or it improves society, or it's for the greater good, or it does this, or it does that. Like, those are fine justif Those are fine justifications, but it misses the point of you know, the definition of theft. Theft is, by definition, taking someone's property without their consent. So the only relevant criteria, if you're trying to argue that taxation isn't theft, the only relevant criteria is whether or not I agreed to it before the government took my money. And now you could, you could argue, you could be, you could be arguing that, yeah, taxation is theft, but it's justified or it's needed to maintain society or whatever justification you want to use. But uh, unless you're going to argue that I agreed to it, I gave the government permission to take my money, then um, you can't. You, you're not. You're not really arguing whether or not taxation is theft. If that makes sense. Sure. I, yeah. Absolutely. I would respond to it by saying that by your own definition and criteria that we're using, where sure. you say people have to consent to it. When we step into the voting booth and vote for politicians who endorse this sort of system we have where we have all these organizations funded by taxation all these regulatory agencies and government bodies and so forth when i step into the voting booth and vote for some democratic politician who supports these things i am consenting to it and if a majority of people in this country vote for politicians who also support this the majority is also consenting to it so it is done with our consent so when we talk about you know taxation is theft what am i doing if if not stealing from myself by that definition, because I'm saying I support the system, so are the majority of other people who vote for it. And so to talk about theft, it's it's like imagining yourself picking your own pocket. You know, it's ridiculous on its face. And th the way it works in a democracy is unfortunately sometimes people get outvoted. If, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent of people support a certain policy or system or something like that, and 10 percent doesn't, then those laws are going to be enforced the laws they're going to be enforced and that's you might not like it you might not like the system you might want to change it but to talk about it as if it's theft i think is not accurate it's simply just people don't agree with you on the subject and that's why they don't vote libertarian right so there's a few uh points i, I would respond to that and of course um i make some of these points in the response video uh, so you said you've only watched parts of it so you, you may not have picked up on these points but uh, first one is if you're going to say that taxation isn't theft because we because we agree to it by voting, that's not really an argument. Best case scenario, right? Best case scenario, that's an argument that taxation isn't theft for most people, right? Because it's not just you you uh, you use the grocery store analogy. If I go into a grocery store and I, I agree to pay for something from the store, am I stealing from myself? I'm like, well, in that instance, you're not because you're the only one paying for it. In the case of tax taxation, when you vote for a government program, you're not stealing from yourself. You're stealing from all the people who don't want to, who don't want it or don't want to pay for it because everybody gets that tax increase. And I kind of call, call you out on that, on that analogy. I would say, if you want a more inapt analogy, have this, how the, the grocery store offers the food at a lower price than they would ordinarily because they force other people to pay whether they shop there or not. That would be a more apt analogy. So that would be my first response to that. Yeah, I I don't know. I, I feel like it's I feel like there's a fundamental problem with with this line of argument sure. that you're making, yes. because because this this is a system the vast majority of us agree to live under in the voting booths. I mean, what percent of the country vote libertarian? It's, it's got to be like one, two percent at most. So it, it's like this this is the way democracy and laws work like if if we agree to pass laws where it's like there's a speed limit or you have to wear your seatbelt or something like that it's if there are five percent of people who disagree with the speed limit that's set or wish that they couldn't wear their seatbelt it'd be like calling that akin to slavery it's like i'm being enslaved and forced to forced to operate under the these crushing rules it, it just seems it seems like it's 
it's the wrong terminology to describe it in such dramatic ways when really what's happening is societies coming together and agreeing to institute certain policies, have our system operate in a certain way. And not everybody agrees with that, but but that's the way our, our society is set up to where like sometimes people get outvoted. And I just, I feel like you're being way too dramatic with your language when you talk about it like that. Well, it sort of has to, like I said, it sort of has to do with, um, I understand the word theft often has the emotional underpinning to it. And that's why a lot of people do get that knee-jerk reaction, like, "Oh no, t taxation isn't theft." No, 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 because because when they when they hear the word theft, it has that negative connotation built into the word. So people hear that and they think, "Oh, I have to argue that it's not theft because taxation being theft is bad." Uh, not sort of realizing that if, if ninety-nine percent, if every person in the country, the 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 criteria for theft is. Did the previous owner say yes before you took it? That's the criteria. You, if you want to say that, well, a majority of society agreed to it, that, or a majority of, of people uh, want to take that money from him, then it's like, okay, yeah, but it's not a majority of society's money. It's that person's money. So that's the person you need to consent from. If you're going to use the, the sort of mob rule collective argument, then that's a justification. That's not a denial that taxation is theft. My, res my response to that would be, we live in a country with over 300 million people. If the standard we set was 100% of people have to agree before any law gets passed, nothing would ever get done. Well, that's sort of the uh, issue with dem democracy. So, of, of course, uh, I'm, uh, a lot of people will think democracy is like the ideal form of government, that democracy is the best way of doing everything. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I, I, I'm going to go out, I'm going to take a leap of faith and say, you believe that as well. <laughs> Not necessarily pure democracy. Actually, I think there should be limits on it. Like, uh, right. you know, I think John Stuart Mill in his classic book on Liberty makes some good points about how, if you just had mob rule where 51% of people could agree to like throw 10% of people in prison because of their religious views or whatever, it should, it should be democracy within a certain framework where you have like certain rights that are enumerated and make clear and it, it, democracy within certain guidelines and boundaries is what I would say. And representative right. democracy, not necessarily okay. pure democracy where like right, every person know... votes on every single decision. Cause that would be horribly impractical. So I would say representative democracy within common sense uh, boundaries. Right. Right. Cause I know um, democracy is kind of an umbrella term that can describe any number of uh, systems of government. Uh, basically what I, what I advocate for is uh, I don't. I don't want to get bogged. I don't want to get too bogged down in the semantics because I feel that kind of misses the point. Like if I, if I, like I could, like if I could, I could say that you know, you need to, you need to, you're, you're basically saying that to have a system of taxation that's that's not theft would be impractical. So we kind of have to, for the sake of practicality, we kind of have to have. Hey, if you're in a minority, sorry, you, you kind of lose out. Uh, you have to hand over your money. It, it's it's theft, but we're 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 justifying it, uh, basically. Well, I'm not I'm not conceding that it is theft by in in that scenario we're talking about because I'm saying when you live in a society where decisions have to be made dependent upon voting for representatives, I I don't call it theft or slavery or cruelty or anything like that when some small percentage disagrees. That's that's just that's how decisions are made in a society that has hundreds of millions of people. So I, I'm I'm not agreeing with your your characterization of that minority disagreeing as theft or slavery or whatever it is. It, I, I I just think it's people simply getting outvoted. So our gang. So here's here's the thing: when people use this whole mentality of uh, the collective will or the c consent of the group uh, taking precedence over consent of the the individual, right? And I I know this is going to sound like weird. Or, or stupid or whatever, but hear me out. Are gangbangs rape? Are gangbangs rape? Yes. Uh, we, uh, a, a majority. Was... Yeah, yeah. A majority. Of, we we get when we have a gangbang, right? We get together and we have a group of people, and it's like, well, we we as a collective consent to it. I mean, she she didn't consent to it. She said no, but we as a collective 
consent to it. If, if well, you... even even here in this analogy, you're using a weird definition because uh, thinking back to the gangbang I had last night. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> the, it, when I when I think of the term gangbang, I imagine just a group of consensual adults having sex with multiple partners, and you're you're throwing just you just lump a person in there who's not consenting to it. So even in this analogy, you're using a weird definition that doesn't conform to what's actually happening. Right, right. But uh, I, I know some, some of the terminology may be a bit um, hard, hard to pinpoint exactly, but the, the, the basic idea is sort of the moral issues that come up when you say consent of the majority or consent of society uh, precedes the consent of the individual is, is kind of the idea that that intended to, to get across. Uh, yeah, I mean, the point the point I'm making is for decisions to be made, not everybody can agree to it. And the solution, if you're in that minority group, is not to cry about it and, and call it theft or slavery. It's to it's to activate and try to convince people to come over to your side and vote for your side so that when it comes time to, to make decisions the next time around in the voting booth, more people agree with you. Yeah, but there's sort of the issue of I need I need other people's permission to keep my own property. It, it's not how property works. It's the other way around. By definition of the concept of property, I mentioned this in my response video, by definition of the word property, the burden of justification is on the person taking, not the person keeping. Right? Yeah, I, I would just say, if we set it up to where the legal system says some percentage of your income is going to go to the government and be used to benefit all of us, that's the system we live under. And it's it's like, if that's the agreement that society comes to, that people living in this society are going to have to follow these guidelines and adhere to these rules, uh, you know, contingent upon them being a part of society, that's just the way society is set up, you know? Right. So I'm going to go out and limb and say you support the idea of a uh, social contract. Is that correct? You know, I, I don't even view it in terms of, frankly, I've, I've never been too too drawn to the whole so, so, social contract uh, argument part of it because it always struck me as sort of vague. I, I like to just be much more clear about it and just say this is the agreement that society has arrived at. And, at, you know, since you live in the society, you, you have to follow the laws that we set up. That's the way I like to put it. Right. So uh, right off the bat, I noticed there's there's a problem. Uh I, I would still argue that you're advocating for for theft, but justifying it. But that's semantics. Uh, I don't want to get too bogged down on that. Um, but basically, the the main issue is, and I, and I mentioned this in my response video. How do you define living in society? Because it, it seems like, and, and I, I've in my response video, I give the example of a person who owns a plot of land who's more or less self-sufficient, like they grow their own food, they produce their own electricity, they filter their own water, uh, their house, uh, they, they, they maintain their own property, they, 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 uh, they run a business on their own property, so they're, they're able to make their own income. They're more or less um, self-sufficient, uh, they, but, but their property just so happens to be within the territory of a state, of the government. So is, is living in society, as you call it, a like, geographical concept? Do they have to be, do they have to meet some sort of minimum standard of interacting with other people? And that, that's kind of the, the, the vagueness of terms like society. And that's, that's kind of, that's a, that's an issue I bring up in my response video. No, it's, those are definitely good questions to explore on the subject and they're definitely right. important ones to ask. Right. And Number one, I would point out this whole idea of this this rugged, self-sufficient man who's living off the land and producing his own electricity and so forth. This is like one in ten million people in this country. <laughs> so that sort of that sort that sort of idealized wild man, who, right. you know, he lives in a in a cabin and has has this grizzly beard and, and <laughs> you know walks around in camo. This is like one in ten million people. Right, right. So so that sort of example doesn't really have relevance to the ninety nine percent of libertarians who actually do live within society. And they have day jobs and they drive on the same highways and roads that we do and they drink the same tap water that we do and they benefit from the same food regulations and they benefit from the building regulations and on and on and on. So the point I make is the vast, vast majority, 99 percent of libertarians who live within the geographical boundaries of our country are integrated in society in this way. And to talk about 
you know, it's their income, they earned it, overlooks the fact that they're benefiting from the many protections and services that this government provides for them. You know, drinking, they can focus on their business because they're not drinking polluted tap water that's giving them dysentery and horrible diarrhea. They can focus on, on growing their business because they're not suffering from food poisoning, because there aren't, uh, you know, shoddy, unsafe food practices practiced at the meatpacking plants. They, you know, they can drive to work to, to meet with a client and negotiate a deal on highways that are maintained by the governments. And, and and even if we're talking about the dude who's living on some fucking law in some, you know, on some plot of land in a cabin. Right. Even this person doesn't have to worry about some invaders coming into his land from a foreign country and chopping him in half with a sword because we have a government that's protecting our country. So the point I would make is that if you actually look at the way that people are living, even if they claim to be libertarians who, you know, I want to do my own thing and it's my property, this this income was made because that there are so many of these regulations that they benefit from. And, you know, libertarians talk about I feel I feel like they have it backwards because they talk about the government is stealing from me. But if you were living in the society and you weren't contributing to to maintaining it through your tax dollars, you'd be the real freeloader here. You'd be the one that would be stealing the benefits from all these programs that you're not paying for. Right. And uh, one of the questions I bring up in my response video is, is benefiting from something in and of itself enough to create a justification to pay for it? Like, let's say that I benefit from something, whether or not I agree to it, just the fact that I benefited from it means I have to pay for it. Is that is that what you believe? Well, if benefiting from that thing, if the thing that you benefit from could only exist and be maintained if everybody chips in, then yeah, I would say everybody has an obligation to chip in. Right, because I, uh, I, I've heard this argument before because um, you're, you're not the first person I, I've argued this point with. I've, I've had this argument with a lot of other people. This idea that consent or not, you benefit from it, so pay up, right? This idea. Uh, I, I have a lot of problems with it, but probably the uh, the, the one that immediately comes to my mind is for some reason, this seems to only apply to government services. Like when the private sector provides a service that you may benefit from, like like in my in my response to it, I use the example of I go to my friend's house to watch a sports game. Uh, can a cable company charge me? Because I benefited from it. Doesn't matter. I didn't I didn't sign up for their service. I didn't agree to it, but uh, I benefited from it. So, like, why does this logic stop at government services? Is basically what I'm asking. Yeah. Well, just look at the payment mechanism. How how do these cable companies uh, pay their bills? <clears throat> they have it set up to where people sign a contract and they watch television and it, it, you're purchasing a product or service from them. It's totally different from a government agency that like has a, 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 a water treatment plant that they, they test for chemicals and impurities and make sure that the water you're drinking is not going to kill you. It's like we're talking about totally different things here. One is like, oh, I benefit from uh, from playing basketball at my buddy's house. So therefore, like, should I be forced to pay this company to use their orange ball? It's, <laughs> it's, it's totally different comparing that against like, we keep your drinking water safe so you don't die using this, this really complicated uh, factory and building or treatment plant, whatever you want to call it. it. I just don't feel like you're comparing like and like. Right, because uh, obviously I've heard, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard this as well, the public goods, natural monopolies, um, those types of arguments. Uh, do, you, do you believe, uh, is that basically what you're arguing? Like, uh, could you spell spell out what the argument is, and I'll let you know if I agree with it. Okay, so uh, one of the one of the biggest justifications for say having something run by the government versus the private sector is that what's called a public good, something that uh, they're, they're, the basic idea is that because it's difficult to exclude non payers, it it kind of necessarily has to be funded through coercion, and, and common examples they list are like uh, clean air. Like, uh, how do we exclude clean air from people who don't pay the EPA, right? So is that is that sort of the rationale you're taking? Well, yeah, basically, because if if you if people can just opt out of paying for these things, people inevitably are going to opt out simply to save money because they'll provide all sorts of self-serving rationales like I'm just one person, my money's irrelevant. And what would happen under such a system is that funding would dry up for these institutions, the quality of society would decline. And it's it's kind of that classic problem of the tragedy of the commons where it's like, if, if there is no policy implemented where we all agree, we're all gonna chip in to maintain society and make sure that it's functioning to standards that we agree to, then people, 
will then then the standard will decline, whether we're talking about pollution or the safety of your drinking water or the safety of the food that we eat. So there does have to be that element of we all agree to chip in, because if not, uh, you know, society all around the board will just decline. Wait, do we all agree to chip in or is it based on coercion? We you seem all to be going agree. back and forth. We we agree in the sense that the vast majority of us vote for this in the voting booth. And that gets back to my earlier point where that's how decisions are made in a big country. OK, so I know toward towards the end of your video, you kind of talk about voluntary taxation and why you don't believe it would work. Right. Uh, I was actually going to. Uh, this this will this will probably not uh, come to any sort of surprise to you. This probably won't shock you at all. But I advocate for voluntary taxation. <gasps> <laughs> I know. Right. Shocker. <laughs> A libertarian wants taxes be voluntary. Gee, that's a – yeah, I know. But um, I noticed in your video – So how, how, would that, how would that work to you? Right. So I noticed in your video you seem to equate voluntary taxation with donations, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so, so when we say the free market is free, when we, when we say capitalism is voluntary, that doesn't mean I can go into a store, grab whatever I want off the shelf, and then as I'm leaving decide whether or not to pay for it. You know, it's not it's not the payment that's voluntary, but the basis on which the service is provided. So uh, I'm not sure if I saw a video. I made a video responding to uh, David Pacman, where he uh, talks about the social contract, and uh, he compared a lot of people who advocate for the social contract uh, compare it to a restaurant. Like, uh, uh, you, you tacitly agree to uh, pay for whatever you eat by going to the restaurant. There's no overt agreement that type of rationale. So if, if you're not, if, if the social, if, if, the, if the social contract isn't, isn't valid, then neither are restaurants is basically the argument they make. And my, my rebuttal to that is, well, if the social contract is like a restaurant, does the government have a menu? Do they have a list of services that they provide and what they charge? Cause I, I even, I even outright said, I said, if I had a choice, if, if, if the government, if there's a system of taxation where say, I got to got like a list of government services and I got to say pick and choose which ones I wanted. Uh, I'd, I'd be totally happy with that. So, yeah, I can't really answer for other people's uh, analogies that they made. The restaurant analogy, definitely not the sort of thing I would come up with uh, to, to make my case. So so I can't really speak to that part of it in, right. in terms of it not being donations akin to donations. I mean, it seems to me what you just described there is exactly that where you just, you look at what's on the menu and you say, this is what I do want to fund. This is what I don't want to fund. It's all done voluntarily. How is that different from looking at a list of charities and voluntarily deciding which to and not to donate to? Well, the idea is that in terms of government, it's you, there would be, you would only get the service if you paid. So you would only be able to drive on roads if you paid for it. You would only, like it would, it would be kind of like, okay, I use roads. I use, here's basically how it would work. You get a tax form, right? I would be like, uh, see, uh, there'd be a list of government services. It's like, okay, I use roads, so I'll pay for that. Uh, I use the police, so I'll pay for that. Uh, I send my kids to a private school, so I don't need public education. I get health care through my employer. I don't need Medicare. I have an IRA. I don't need social security. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like the idea of like, uh, in a private sector, when you do business with with a company, right? Do do restaurants charge you for food you don't eat? Do you know cable companies charge you for channels you don't watch? The, the uh, they do, but you know, uh, the idea is that it's not. Rather than just saying, okay, here's the here here's we're just going to take a chunk of your your income your income and spend it however the fuck we want. You know, the the people have a little little bit more of a, a direct input because you know a lot of people hate. The, the fact of the matter is people hate paying taxes, right? Like even, even non-libertarians like dread it. They, they, they hate tax. Even a lot of progressives also, they like the idea of taxes, but not so much paying them. Uh, I'm sure yeah, you can probably which, sympathize, but I think. Which I feel like is an argument more for my case than yours, but go on. Right. I, but I think a big part of the reason people hate paying taxes is because they don't have – it isn't because they want government services for free or because they're not willing to fund governments because there's no choice. The government just expects you to pay up. You're paying for services you don't use. You're paying for uh, stuff you don't – you're funding wars and stuff that you don't like. I, I, I feel like there's 
there's a a more there's a way of doing it that involves more of a a choice where you're you're still addressing the free rider problem you're still making sure people are paying for what they use obviously but there's also the issue of you know giving people a little more of a choice and that's that's basically what i believe yeah i mean i i would respond by asking how does one choose or choose not to to breathe in the clean air like how how do I select on my tax form? I I want to I want my air to be clean, versus like not clean. Well, there's no uh, way to do it. You know, you're we we live in a country where the atmosphere is the atmosphere, and that's the way that it is. And especially in terms of something like climate change, where it's like this is a global issue where where these factories are polluting. It, 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 like you can't like one group of people will fund like the you know, the, the, the non coal factories and one will, I just, I just don't understand how this would work at the level of like, you're living in society. And if these companies are polluting the air or polluting the, the rivers that you and your children swim in, it's not like you, you can vote to, to swim in the non polluted river. These, these are common things that we all share. So how do you get around that? Right. So of course this is, this is the free, this is what's called the free rider problem. And it goes back to the concept of public goods. There's certain things that are difficult to exclude non-payers from. And uh, my initial response to this is, who says it's just the the EPA who's keeping the 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 air clean? You could have private. You can also have private sector companies or nonprofits also doing similar environmental work, and they would they they would they would be funded through presumably funded through donations as well and. So that that's one potential solution, but well, how how could they possibly have the force of law to step in, come on a, a factory's private property, and say, "Listen, motherfuckers, you can't dump these chemicals. You can't produce this chemical in this way because it leaches all sort of bad chemicals to the product." There'd be no way for them to to trespass and hop over the barbed wire fence and wag their finger at them and tell them this is what you have to do. So without without the threat, without the force of law there to step in and be like, "This is what you have to do," and if you don't like it, that's too bad because this is a condition of you operating within the space without that in place there's going to be no teeth behind these sort of private companies that are there to clean up the environment and even if we granted that like you know you have you have the factory on the on the one side of the river that's dumping the pollutants and then you have the private company down river who's like you know frantically trying to depollute the river to the point where there aren't mass fish die-offs and people aren't dying of horrible cancers and other diseases that they get from swimming in this river even if even if somehow we did have a system like that where where there was a company trying to react in this way this would be a reactive approach and not a proactive approach where you're tr- you're constantly firefighting and try oh my god there's a mass fish die-off over over there there's a bunch of people getting cancer in this lake and so forth it's a totally reactive approach where you could only respond to problems after people are suffering and dying horribly from it whereas the regulatory scheme that i advocate is proactive in the sense where no you're not going to pollute this river to begin with so we're not going to have the problems people aren't going to die of these cancers in the first place well uh getting back to um back to dave rubin's whole arguments there um he does Briefly, he they, he doesn't go into detail, but he briefly mentions it towards the end of the towards the end of the exchange on the environment. He mentions that, yeah, government uh, in the li- libertarian uh, just believe that the government it's legitimate for the government to protect property rights. So uh, because of that, uh, Rubin basically tried to make the case that there's some flexibility within libertarianism to have some some environmental regulation uh, because. To pollute someone's property would be to violate their rights. So, uh, what I'd argue is that in a libertarian society where you have property rights, it's much, much more difficult to get away with damaging the environment than under government. Because you think about what happens under government, the a company will pollute the water, they'll pollute the air, they'll they'll what they'll do it's basically pay to pollute. They'll 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 pay out. They'll they'll be some slap on the wrist fine that they have to pay. Uh, or some inspector that they bribe, or some some outright racket like cap and trade, where it's basically like uh, you can pollute all you want as long as you pay us, and it's like there's no accountability to the property owners in that area that they're harming. Whereas in a libertarian society where you have property rights, now there's a way for us to actually go after people who damage the environment in a more market-based way. Yeah. I, I would say several things to that. Sure. Number one, let's let's say we have a system where it's like 
you basically what you outlined there is well if you're polluting my private property uh it's actually a much stronger incentive for me to take action against it and clamp down on it <clears throat> Number one, how would I be able to possibly determine, sitting here on my home, that, oh, you know, these air pollutants that I'm breathing in are from this particular factory? If it's private property, if I can't go on there and test what they're putting out and so forth, there'd be no possible way for me to, to determine which particular point sources are responsible for the pollutants that are, that are coming at me. And if we had this sort of a system, you would have all kinds of different factories pumping out pollution relaxing their standards, dumping shit in the river, because it's, you know, there, there's not that regulatory system that's stopping them from doing this. So if they can all save money from doing it, this would be the only rational business decision to make. If your competitor across the river is cutting corners and they're not paying to have their chemicals shipped off and they can save millions of dollars this way, it would not be the rational business decision for you to do this. So you'd be losing out on it. So it's like a race to the bottom where everyone's going to pollute to it. And let's just imagine that. Let's say, let's say miraculously, I do figure out there's one particular source that's polluting my property, polluting the air that I breathe. It's wafting over from this factory six miles away. And somehow I managed to figure it out. Do you actually believe that me as some individual asshole just sitting here in my apartment, I can go up against these massive behemoths who have billions of dollars in revenue, these giant oil companies, I can take them to court against their teams of lawyers and beat them as a one private individual who, who can pay the bills and then like a tiny bit more on top of that. How could I possibly afford to do this? How could I beat them? It's just totally impractical and not realistic at all. Right. So when you mentioned, uh, just to go back a bit, the very first thing I think you mentioned uh, there was the idea that companies will pollute to save money because it's because it's cheaper. It, it's, it reduces their costs. I would argue that you you identified just the problem there that it's expensive. It's a cost for them to properly maintain to, to dispose of these chemicals. And the brilliant the brilliance of the free market is that that's, that creates incentive to reduce the cost of getting rid of those chemicals, these those wastes, or possibly put them to good use. And historically, we've seen examples of that where an industry will be very nasty to the environment. They'll be very heavy on pollution. And then some innovation comes along where it's like, hey, we can reuse the waste for this. And the pollution decreases by several orders of magnitude. The, the two biggest examples I can think of are the beef industry and the oil industry. Uh, the oil industry, like uh, back in the day, it used to be they would refine the oil. Re once they refined the crude, they got the gasoline from it. The byproduct would just be dumped into the river. It's waste. But uh, smart people came along and said, hey, this waste that you're just dumping in the river, we can make money off of that. Now we have uh, all sorts of products. We have asphalt, rubber, plastic, uh, kerosene, benzene, a whole list of things that, that were once trash or that was once like, get rid of this. This is useless. And, and it turns out that that profit incentive ended up cleaning up the environment. Uh, 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 like the, like uh, rivers that run through oil refineries looked way different, you know, after that. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you can make a similar example for a, any number of other industries. So that would be my response to that. Oh, you could. What? Oh, no, I thought I think I misunderstood what you were saying. I, I thought you were saying you could make a whole bunch of other examples of industries polluting. I, I misunderstood what you were saying there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so so I, I would respond by putting it in this way. Early on in U.S. history, there were tons of problems with the rivers being horribly polluted by all these different factories, all these industries, pollution so bad that, you know, nothing could survive inside of there. All the organisms died off. Good luck swimming in there. Sometimes it was e even so bad that some of the rivers and bodies of water caught on fire. The thing that changed that, the thing that cleaned up these rivers wasn't the occasional savvy businessman figuring out that he could take one of, you know, hundreds of potential pollutants and find out some sort of some sort of way to to, to refine that or, or convert it to a product or sell it to the market in such a way. That, uh, that he can make some additional profit. The thing that changed us from that system of rampant pollution was government regulation. You could point to a couple examples where it's like something that used to be waste. There's now some sort of way that we can profit from it. But the idea that that's going to happen all across the board for every single potential source of trash or pollutant or something, I'm sorry, it's just not realistic. Right. Uh, well, I mean, 
It's 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 true though. I mean, it, like Exxon, there's a lot of research on like carbon sequestration, like the the CO2 that's contributing to global warming. It's like this pipe we can pipe it underground and reuse it in certain ways. Like there's one company that was like, we built this machine that captures CO2 from the air and makes plastic out of it. You know things like that. But you did mention the rivers um, being on fire, and and the EPA c- coming in to fix that. Uh, I just watched a video from Shane Killian this morning that kind of debunks that. Uh, uh, I have the video kind of pulled up here right now, and he has a source in the description. Sources from Scholarly Commons Law, case.edu. Reconstructing a History of Environmental Protection. And of course, um, I, I can link you to all this information, both the video from Shane and the video from and and the article. Basically, the the point that they're getting across is that the the river fires were kind of blown out of proportion. the 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 exact data on how long the the fires lasted is inaccurate, and, and the location and and some of the sources are not, are a bit inaccurate. And a lot of it was fabricated to justify basically creating the EPA, basically an excuse to expand government power. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this, this reference you're citing. For all I know, it could be some sort of libertarian think tank. I can't really evaluate something that I haven't personally read and closely examined in research. Even if we grant what you're saying is correct, where it's like, well, you know, the, the degree of how long the rivers were on fire for may have been exaggerated in some cases. I mean, wow, talk about quibbling over small details that are just totally irrelevant to the broader point that I'm making. You know, the general point I'm making is before we had these regulatory agencies stepping in to to ensure compliance with guidelines on what you can and can't dump in the river and so forth. In general, pollution all across the board was much greater. And just to look at details like, well, you know, maybe how long the river was on fire for was exaggerated in some historical recountings totally doesn't undermine that general point that I'm making. Right. So. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. I was just kind of um, looking up the video. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, try, try and, I'm, I'm kind of using that as, as a source here because obviously uh, the fact that, oh, evidence was fabricated to expand government power, that's kind of a bold claim. And of course, bold claims need bold evidence, so... <laughs> yeah, you, frankly, I'd rather I'd rather we just keep it contained to to a back and forth dialogue. I don't really want to get into like external references and reading and stuff like that. Uh, I'd, I'd prefer that we just talk about it instead of like, you know, pull up a bunch of sources to read from, you know? Yeah, that's fine. So I th- the the government has also caused a lot of uh, environmental damage. Uh, and and when, when you I, I have a feeling that if you if you like the bombs dropped on Japan and a, a certain government programs that uh, like military factories that emitted a lot of metals into the the river there's one uh, or agent orange polluting cambodia vietnam that's probably one of the best examples exactly so it's not like environmental harm is strictly something the private sector does you know uh yeah i mean i never said that though so right it's, right it's uh, kind of a not, point. i'm not really i'm not really sure what you're getting at there with that the, the point i'm making is the response to that pollution even pollution that the government is making isn't to eliminate the government and, and just open it up to this libertarian free for all. The pollution is better regulation in these particular areas, but, you know, regarding the specific pollutants that are being emitted. That's the solution that I would call for. Well, nobody's... it's not like well, you know, it's not like well, the government factory polluted, so let's just let's let's get rid of all these government agencies. No, how about we just make it so they don't pollute as much? It seems to me that that's a much simpler, more effective, and more intelligent response. Right. So uh, first of all, no. Uh, we're not really saying that there shouldn't be any government involvement in the uh, protecting the environment, because like I said, right. uh, a lot of libertarians believe that property rights are le- a legitimate thing that the government can protect. Like I like I can protect your property rights, Anton. If someone is going if someone's busting into your house uh, and, and stealing your stuff, I, 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 I can come in there and stop them. Right. Because uh, property rights are universal you don't need a special badge or a special uniform or a special paper to enforce property rights so 
So well, that would be very kind of you, I have to say. <laughs> It, 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 exactly, but it's like that's that's sort of the libertarian I, idea that property rights are, are universal, and then and if if I have a right to protect my property on my behalf, so does everyone else, and that extends. Uh, not all libertarians are anarchists. Some of them do believe that government is has a role to play in society, and uh, certain functions that are are legitimate for government, like uh, enforcing protecting your person and, and, and protecting your property. Uh, your, you, like I mentioned, your natural rights. Uh, I'm uh, uh, saying libertarians are big on like natural deontological rights. Uh, not sure what your your thoughts are on that, but well, I maybe I missed it at one point, but I feel like I never got an answer to my earlier question, and you you just kind of brought up a good opportunity for me to to reiterate it. Sure. Where you're saying like you know property rights that gives me the opportunity to deal with these pollution uh, instances effectively. I don't. I don't recall getting a good answer to my question, where I said, "How could I, some some individual asshole who who you know gets just enough money to get by, how could I possibly sue these multi-billion-dollar companies with entire teams of lawyers that could just ruin my life and drag the case on for forty years and just bankrupt me? What what uh, you know what what kind of infinitesimally infinitesimally small chance would I have of actually beating them in court?" Right. So uh, again, like I uh, discussed previously, the 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 mechanism of litigation, the, the 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 system by which disputes are arbitrated, would be different uh, under a libertarian society. Uh, I, I gave examples of how the government kind of botches up courts, makes them really slow, inefficient. Uh, you know, the the bar association makes lawyers expensive. There there. There would be much less of that in a libertarian society. So right off the bat, you're on a more level playing field. Uh, continuing. Okay, so so let's so the the speed increases because we get the government out of it. That's one thing, and then lawyers are are less expensive under your system. Okay, the company still has way more financial resources than me. So even if lawyers are less expensive, they're less expensive for both of us. So it's like lawyers used to cost this much for both sides. Now it's this much for both sides. It does. It doesn't even the playing field at all because these changes would happen for both sides. So it still puts me on. It still puts me on the wrong side of that unequal power power imbalance. Right. Well, there's other there's other ways the system would would be improved as well. Like if you had if you had more private or decentralized arbitration, like uh, it, it would be much more difficult to for them to like buy out influence courts. Uh, Directly, uh, there, there uh, there'd be another multitude of different things. Uh, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but another possibility is if there's uh, an environmental nonprofit, let's say, in your area, and they're also concerned about this, there's a good chance that they will have the funding and resources, and they'll be willing to sort of team up with. Because, because here's the thing. It, it, let, let's assume that it's, let's assume that you're right. That it would be monumentally difficult to tackle these corporations. Let's assume that that's right for you, the little guy. Not much time, not much money. It would be difficult for you to go up against these corporations. There may be some truth to that. These, uh, however, these big, uh, these other environmental nonprofits, other people that are also in your situation would be able to band together, pool their resources, and put up much more of a fight. Because after all, if if there's if the if this pollution is affecting you, there's a good chance it's also affecting other people who live near you, other people in that general area. So that that's a good pool of resources to draw from as far as building up a uh, movement, I guess you could call it, to deal with this. Yeah, I'd say a few things. I it obviously makes it way more complicated if. You know, we have to band together as a neighborhood to to pool our resources and and get this get this environmental nonprofit to team up against us and maybe perhaps against all odds we could beat this oil corporation. That seems way more complicated than simply having a government that says these are the rules, follow them or fuck off. You know, it it, it seems to me even in that idealized situation where everything works according to plan, there's so much work involved and, and, and so much potential room for error that it's just way more overcomplicated. And frankly, you know, these these changes to the court system that you're talking about where you're like, you know, there'd be revisions to the court system under my system that would make it easier. Uh, 
it just, it doesn't strike me as very convincing to to just I don't know. I mean, right. I, a, I, a lot of it's like 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 what you said is you off the top of your head you can't really re- can't really remember it. But if you're presenting to us this idea where it's like we should fundamentally overhaul our system, and I I just bring up to you some some very common sense uh, questions I have where I'm like, how would this work? And you're like, I'm not really sure. It's it's just not very convincing to me. Right. I, I understand that. And uh, there there's a there's a lot of resources to talk about like how exactly private courts would work and how arbitration would be different. Uh, uh, with less government, uh, I, I think probably the biggest whatever whatever happens, I think that's probably the biggest uh, the 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 absolute biggest thing that I think would happen is you you would have that the people kind of banding together, starting this movement, this nonprofit. Because you mentioned that that this the, in order to have these regulations passed, these environmental regulations passed, you have to vote someone in that will pass them. You have to campaign for them. So. Th- if you're if you're arguing against it on that, it would be too complicated because we'd all have to band together and do this and do that. You'd all have to band together under and and you know do, do all that stuff, kind of stuff anyways. So if anything, yeah, but we already have those laws in place, so that work has already been done. Right, but just because laws are in place doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to follow through with it. You know, there's that doesn't mean there's going to be any sort of like uh, bribes or any sort of shady anything like that going on, right? You still got to keep that's, that. That's that's I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's that seems like a totally separate issue where it's like, well, perhaps they won't enforce them as effective if, as effectively as we would like. That's a totally separate question. If that's the problem at hand, then we deal with that by making it so that they do enforce the laws more effectively. And I don't I don't I don't find it a very strong critique of these regulations to say maybe they wouldn't be totally enforced all the way because in a sense it almost seems like you're conceding they are a good idea, but darn it, you know, since they're not being totally enforced, that's a problem for us. Well, I mean, it's just, it's the same kind of issues you'd have with uh the the private sector trying to deal with it like you would have it, it's not like these bureaucrats have some kind of like environmental vision where they can see the pollution and they can see the air pollute they they they'd have to do the testing they'd have to do the monitoring they have to do everything the the private sector would have to do as well so it's it's not like the 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 system becomes any more simple it's not like the 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 process by which you go about addressing it suddenly becomes more simple because the government's doing it no, I, I see what you're saying. I don't agree with it because the vision you outlined, it, it's, like, it's like something out of a Hollywood movie where it's like against all odds, the neighborhood banded together and teamed up with this environmental nonprofits to pool their resources. And only then did they have a chance of beating this multi-billion dollar oil corporation. It's like even in this idealized scenario where everything works according to plan, it's still like – well, maybe in that case, we have a chance at beating these oil companies in court. It just it doesn't strike me as a vision of society that's very compelling. It's not the kind of thing that I'm eager uh, to, to move in the direction of. And I would also point out nonprofits like this, they exist already under our system. Right. And a lot of them are. Trying to think. Oh, yeah. Uh, another point I was going to bring up was that there's. A general. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Heritage Foundation, right? Yeah. So basically, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's not data, not just from them, but some from some other sources that basically say that there's a correlation between how economically free a country is and how healthy their environment is. Like if you look at some of the places that have the worst pollution, they're places with authoritarian governments, like the Soviet Union, uh, uh, China. Uh, America, not that America's environment is pristine by any stretch of the imagination, but we have we're way cleaner than like China and uh, the, the former Soviet Union, where there's, there's lakes that are radioactive because there's so much pollution. And um, I have some sources. I actually have the um, the tab pulled up here with some sources. I can give those to you if you want to kind of verify that. Did yeah, just on on their face, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock into these Heritage Foundation claims. Um, can you hear me? Okay. I think my earpiece is, is losing its battery. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I might have to, uh, switch over to a different headset at some point. Uh, although looking at the time, we might just wrap this up here soon, but I've uh, just given you right. fair warning. I, I might not be able to hear you at some point. So, so I don't think I'm talking over <laughs> you or whatever. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so on, on their face, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock into what the heritage foundation says, but just hearing what you said, 
comparing the U.S. against a country like China, where it's like this authoritarian communist regime, definitely not the best comparison. You know, c compare against countries like uh, Western European countries where they have stricter environmental guidelines. And I guarantee you would reach a different conclusion. Right. So what, what's your uh, what's your response to, say, issues where we have a we have a system where the government doesn't have much of a, a an incentive, I guess, to protect the property of how do I want to, how do I want to phrase this? So if it, I'm listening, I'm right. listening. Hang on. Okay. Gotta get my headphones here, though. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm just gonna make the switch now because I'm like I'm way too conscious of this and it's kind of distracting me. So give me a second. I'm gonna switch over to to a different headset. Take your time. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So, I I just realized there's there's sort of an ish contradiction with some of your arguments. For example, when I... Okay, I think I can hear you. Hello? Right. Can you hear me okay? You there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? One sec. How about now? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Right. So whenever I say we use the, the private sector arbitration, the private sector courts to deal with a problem, you're like, oh, that's there's no chances. They're, they're, the, the system's rigged against me. But the, when I mentioned that, you know, government might not necessarily work, you, you use the defense of, well, that's an argument for dealing with government corruption, not 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 an argument against, you know, government getting involved. Well, I, I'd say you're, you're kind of using two different standards here. When it comes to your solution, it's like, oh, well, that's an argument for fixing the system, not for getting rid of it. And then when it comes to my solution, it's like, well, that's a that's a problem with the, that's a problem with the system. We, we should we shouldn't try to fix it. We should just leave it leave it like that. You know, so it's like. I feel like you're kind of employing a uh, different standard, uh, different standards there. If if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I get the point that you're making. I, mine was more a fundamental critique of the very logic that you were putting forth, because because you were saying like, oh well, under this system, uh, lawyers would be cheaper, for example. And I pointed out that right. doesn't level that doesn't level the playing field. It just like changes the location, but there's still the unequal power balance. So the point I was making is like you're fundamentally not resolving the problem that I presented to you. Well, that kind of assumes that the the quantity of lawyers that, that assumes that there's a direct correlation between the number of lawyers you have and mm -hmm. and how successful your your case is. And there there there's probably a multitude of factors that would actually come into play there. And like I said if 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 the situation goes from having no lawyers to them having a hundred lawyers, and then you go from ten lawyers to having them having let's say five hundred, right? So the proportionality increased. You still have more lawyers than you did before, so you you still have more of a chance. And if those ten lawyers are really good at what they do, it because because that's the thing. I feel like this is this argument kind of emphasizes quantity, not quality. Especially because in the, in, in a in a free market where everything's largely deregulated, there's much more of an emphasis on quality. Yeah, it's not just a quantity-based argument. It's they have more legal resources, so they they can they can pay their lawyers to spend a thousand hours researching and studying and coming up with their arguments. Whereas I might be only able to pay like three hours or something like that. So it's not what, purely what? a matter of quantity versus quality. But it, I mean, come on, let's not be let's not be naive here. If if one company has a hundred thousand times the resources financially to dedicate to their legal defense, they're going to do better overall. I mean, can we both agree on that? I, su I suppose so, but I feel like because in a, in a libertarian society, the laws are based on the non-aggression principle. It's based on logic. It's like saying, if I have a hundred mathematicians that say two plus two is four, and I have one mathematician that says two plus two is four, all right, so sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, that's an inevitable part of doing this via Skype, but uh, you do what you can and you march forward. So we are running short on time here. We're going to go ahead and just wrap up with some final thoughts. I'll just offer my final analysis of this debate, and then I'll open it up to you to have the final word. Sounds good. Uh, my, my overall uh, take would basically be to say that I think libertarianism 
a lot of the ideas sound good when you first hear them. You know, they use a lot of language, like they talk about freedom and personal responsibility and stuff like that. And it might sound good on first inspection, but I think when you really carefully think through the subjects and really ask yourself, what would this mean in terms of building construction, in terms of environmental regulation, uh, in, in terms of workplace protections and employee rights and so forth, I think the vision that they're outlining does away with a lot of the, the hard fought and won progress that we've made over the years in terms of regulations that, uh, that you know, enhance the safety of our environment and buildings and, and protect employees and so forth. And I think in that sense, libertarianism isn't just wrong, but it's actually quite harmful if we were to enact these policies. And uh, I, I think it would be quite a dangerous world to live in. And it's definitely not a direction that I want to take society in. And I'll go ahead and open it up to you for uh, your final words. Right. So I noticed you, you say liberta you believe libertarianism is, is regressive. It, it's it's anti-progress. I'd argue it's just the opposite. I'd argue by having free markets, by enabling competition, by encouraging innovation, we're creating an environment that enables progress. Sure, perhaps the government does enable some progress, but when you're when you're free to make choices on your own, when you're free, when consumers and businesses are free to find the circumstances that work best for them, I think that's really where you're going to get the best results. And I, I do think there's a lot of idealistic notions about. Um, how effective government is and uh, sort of uh, the, the sort of comfort that people get, the idea the government's watching over them, keeping them safe. I feel like that's a comforting thought, but not quite a realistic one, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's my final thoughts. Uh, I, have nothing, I, have, I have nothing else to say uh, at this time, uh, if, unless you do. No, uh, I, I think it was a good debate. Uh, we, there's definitely a lot more that we we didn't get a chance to get to that I would have liked to have discussed, you know, things like uh, we could have talked more about government use of force. We could have talked more about uh, the minimum wage and, you know, uh, workplace protections and stuff like that. We'll definitely have to pick it up again in a second debate for the future, but uh, I enjoyed it. I had a good time. Same here. I feel like um, both good points are made on both sides. Uh, I'll be honest, you, you stumped me a couple of times. You made me think, reconsider, but uh, overall, I feel it was a successful conversation and I look forward to uh, exchanging with you again in the future.